and um, we've got an amazing panel who I'm going to introduce them briefly just to, to make sure we've got as much of the hour as possible um, for the conversation that we want to have. So we're joined by Professor Claire Goodman from the University of Hertfordshire, who's waving to you, um, who is uh, an expert in primary community and, and social care, um, and I think really focused on the lived experiences of care, both of care home residents and care home staff, and which is really um, the right place for us to start our conversation. Um, we're joined by Geraldine Rogers, um, a renowned and multi-award winning nurse leader um, who worked for a number of years in East London, um, created um, famously the Significant Seven uh, process for sp spotting signs of deterioration among um, uh, all the people um, and is now the Deputy Chief Nurse um, in uh, Basildon Brentwood C CCG. Uh, and last but not least, we're joined by Alina Nadanova, the founder of Febris. Alina did her PhD in using machine learning to spot childhood pneumonia, uh, doing her field work in India. Uh, she's worked at the WHO, had a maternal health therapy in the Skull Center for Social Entrepreneurship, and she's built all of that experience and expertise to running Febris, which is about using AI to open up access to early diagnosis or for vulnerable patient groups. Um, so, so what a great panel. I guess it's a panel of an academic, um, a clinician um, and an innovator, we could have brought together a GP, a registered manager and some business authority to do sort of urgent winter planning. So to say that's happening anyway. Um, our focus is on not next week, but next month and the coming months and about the, the changes that are happening in care homes and how to seize this moment um, to capitalise on those changes that have potential to do things better, both for residents and staff. And that, that's the kind of conversation that we want to look to have today. Um, all, all that I need to do to kick us off is try and um, sum up where we are with care homes in 2020, which I'm bound to get um, partly wrong. So as I say, please be gentle, but do feel free to correct me. Um, <clears throat> I guess the only place we can start um, is with the experiences of residents and staff. I know statistics vary, but there's been perhaps 20,000 um, COVID-related deaths in care homes this year, a third of all care home deaths. And of course, there's been um, excess deaths among care staff. Um, for care home staff generally they've had a hell of a time coping with trying to access PPE, um, practical, but a practicable advice, um, uh, prevent spread of COVID while of course caring for for all of their residents um, and in the background they've had to manage their own health and natural concerns um, and those of their families. Um, so it's been it's been quite a time in care homes and um, even for me with the nature of care, care city and infection control at two or three degrees removed, it's been a it's been um, a privilege to see the way that the system has responded. Um, I guess beyond that story of crisis um, response, I know systems across the country are trying to learn the lessons of the last seven or eight months, um, and I know there have been lessons to learn. I've been in conversations um, separately with two different medical directors, sharing their regrets about the way hospital discharges worked and their absolute determination to do better with their system partners um, through this this winter. Um, I know that that's a, a raw and emotive issue but I know it's kind of keenly felt um, in all parts of our health, health and care system. Um, I'm interested in what other lessons that we can learn um, on behalf of those those residents and staff. So alongside that story of crisis and lessons learned, I suppose one of the phrases we've heard a lot in this conversation about care homes has been shining a light um, I think that's important for us today. First of all, of course, a light has been shone on care home residents who, frankly, for too long have had weak, patchy access to really great primary care and they've, they've really needed it. And I think that's been a wake up call um, for the health and care system. I think it's also shone a light on um, our understanding of these residents and who they are. Um, we know that demographics and austerity mean the average resident of a residential home as well as a nursing home is older, um, poorlier and more complex than they were a decade or, or, or two ago. Um, and that's, that's really challenging. Um, and so this process has also shone a light um, on the situation for care home staff um, who cope with huge challenges every day, not just in 2020, but in 2019 too. Um, uh, and for whom I think a gap has opened up between what they're supported to do and I would say 
how they're remunerated um, and the reality of their roles day to day. Um, and as I say, I think for all that's happened in 2020, there's an opportunity to face up to those realities of care home residents and staff um, and do a better job for them. And I know it's amazing to see the, the notes from participants joining. I know many of you are engaged in that um, already and I look, look forward to hearing more about it. Um, before I depress you too far and we can't find the energy to do anything about it, let's also remember that this year for care homes has been a story of incredible resilience and ingenuity. In March we were all um, listening to terrifying examples from elsewhere in Europe um, purporting to be about care, care staff uh, panicking, leaving their posts and the, the collapse of some parts of, of the care system. Of course that hasn't happened here. I know reg registered managers have done a phenomenal job supporting their people, put huge um, amounts of time and energy into that um, and their teams themselves have, 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 have shown in incredible bravery and resilience. Um, and I think that's important for us to, to remember the potential um, that those people have shown as public servants um, and that there is more that they can do and be supported to do in the future. Um, so as I say, our focus today is not the week to week issues of, of winter planning. It's about identifying the deeper changes that are happening in care homes and the systems of care of which they're a part and spotting the opportunities in that to start to do better for care home residents and care home staff. Maybe that's a bit of a luxury. As I say, this is happening in parallel to crisis response and winter planning. I don't think it's a luxury because, as I say, part of the context is um, of care homes that have been too far down political priority list for too long. And now they're at the top of the news. So alongside crisis response, I think it's really vital that now we talk about um, what kinds of opportunities um, and what kind of changes are happening that we want to keep and build on in the months and years to come to improve the lot both of, of, of staff and residents. Um, and I hope we can have start to have some of that conversation today really. Um, it's sort of what we're doing at, at Care City. Um, we've been working our, uh, with Fibris, as Alina will describe, on remote monitoring in care homes, which, which I think has huge potential. We've also been working with a, whole, a huge range of partners supported by Skills for Care to open up the Apprentice Nursing Associate Programme to residential homes who don't themselves employ a nurse. Um, we're really excited about the potential to build new kinds of career paths for care staff um, where they can um, become nursing associates in the future, social workers and nurses, and I don't mean leaving care, I mean within care. Um, and we're excited about other digital tools that we're starting to use, unlocking other care pathways to, for staff to access within care homes. For example, we've been working with another digital, digital innovator to unlock wound care um, to, 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 for, with roles to be played by care staff. But I promise I'll say no more about any of that as your, as your chair, except to say I'm really passionate, not just about using this moment to improve services, but to improve the lot of care homes and their, and their staff. Right, that was me trying to set the scene about care homes in 2020. I hope I did an okay job. But Claire, I wonder if I could bring you in first and kind of what do you need to set me straight on? But in the process, can you just ground us a bit in terms of what the data says about the experiences of care homes and care home staff over the last seven or eight months? What have they been dealing with well, and what does the data say they've been worrying about? Oh, well, it's lovely to say, what does the data say? Thank you for that very open question. Um, so I, I, if I can just, I think the reason I got invited is because we have a study that was started in November um, on looking at how data is used between um, NHS and social care, specifically care homes. And we had anticipated, and that was a response um, to a realization that care homes have are there but have tended to be othered by the NHS. There are often either a problem to the NHS or a solution to the NHS of where they can place people that they no longer wish to have um, under NHS care. So, and in November, we um, were expecting that we were going to have to persuade people of the need for this study. It's a four year study. Um, and 
with the advent of the pandemic, we are now in the situation of running to catch up with all the multiple data driven initiatives which are trying to address all the issues we'd identified in our um, when we submitted for funding about that care home residents are extremely difficult to find in the data systems that we have. Um, even care homes are difficult to count and find and the over-reliance on CQC databases um, uh, raise a whole load of problems. So I think the pandemic has laid bare all the uh, shortcomings of our system and the difficulties, but it has also um, created this opportunity for innovation. And now my anxiety is that the innovation is outstripping um, the evidence a little bit. And so what we are seeing is uh, people doing some great uh, data integration exercises. Um, so one of our work packages is we are working with the Health Foundation to create care home resident data sets that brings together primary and acute care data and social care data and particularly in some areas where they are already working together with um, social care so you know using things like bringing system getting social care to enter onto system one and things like that um, and now we're, when we're going we're, we're going to be working with two integrated ICSs and they're saying oh no we don't need help with data cleaning we've done that <laughs> and we think oh okay and so things are moving extremely rapidly but of course they are slightly short-term responses so it's, I really welcome this seminar to think all right we've, we've got some solutions in place which are working to deal with some issues like the capacity tracker and so on um, but as we draw breath and look and say right everybody's now seen the importance of care homes they are not our problem and nor are they our solution they're our partner and they need to be part of our landscape of care and discussion and uh, i saw one of the people have said about the very white look of the panel and i think that's a fair comment but also i think you know we have to acknowledge it is bringing in the social care voices also something that you know, I, I feel a little bit awkward speaking on behalf of um, our care home providers and representatives, but at the same time, it is quite difficult to bring that voice to the table in a unified way. And I think there are people listening who've heard me talk about that. So I'll stop there and then maybe you can pick up some other points. Thank you, Claire. <clears throat> and let me try and bring in as, as, as as a broader range of voices as I can. Geraldine, if I could bring you in next, could you say a bit about the, the, the work you've been doing and with care homes and to support care homes over, over the last few months and just something about the, the experiences of, of, of care homes and what's been, what, what changes you think have been most significant? Sure, John. And, and first of all, thank you so much for inviting me onto the webinar. I'm, I'm really delighted to be to be here and um, and share our, our what I've been calling our COVID journey. Um, and we've done a, a, a various presentations at different boards at the moment, kind of articulate um, what went on and how it was for us. And um, so I think probably when we started in um, in March. Um, seems like such a long time ago now um, when there, there was an awful lot of noise um, in the system. Um, I think probably knowing my background in um, looking and working with care homes over the last couple of years saw the need quite quickly. Um, so we set up um, a strategic tactical, what it was called, steering group for care homes, um, set up the governance, daily calls, etc. Of course, in those first few weeks, which felt like months at times and the noise of PPE was huge um, and suddenly trying knowing how much needed to be done but knowing this noise wasn't going away and how we would mobilize help and mobilize equipment to um, different destinations was was really an important thing for us because ironically what we needed to do was relay fare. There was so much fare in the system. So by working with um, having this group, our group, we're very fortunate where I work. Um, it's rich in local authorities in that we've got three local authorities, 
five CCGs um, at the time with three acute hospitals and four community providers. So as you can imagine, quite an awful lot of bodies um, to all work together for the common cause. Um, and so um, we kind of set up that system quite quickly. Um, it's, it's interesting what the previous speaker said around pace, because ironically those first few weeks, um, even eight weeks, the pace was very, very quick. And in some ways that was quite amazing because things that we would want to get done for a really long time suddenly was gaining traction. Um, so um, we, that, that area covered 307 care homes, which was equivalent to 9,000 beds. Um, we, uh, during that period, um, with local authority and help, have set up clinical hubs in four of the areas to meet with that need. Um, those around them, we've been working closely with local authority Authority, public health and health all together in one room um, and each day or our virtual rooms now um, and each day um, they meet um, and support the care homes and um, what we're doing at the moment to make sure that the care homes voice is there because they would ring because we were conscious that the care homes initially were getting an awful lot of calls um, and suddenly that was you know, they were so busy um, then. And so it was important we kind of streamlined that for them. So that's where the hub came in. And we ended up having that name clinician linking in with those care homes. Um, so what we're doing now going into the winter, we've set up a WhatsApp group for each of those clinical hubs as well. And getting the care home managers to kind of support each other as well. And I think just getting that sense of comradeship that we have gained through this process too. I think probably things like the NHS mail, getting that up and running. When we started it, our journey was 10%. Um, and suddenly now we find ourselves at 96% and really using that as a vehicle going into winter to help us. The National Bed Tracker, an interesting system in itself. Um, obviously, um, chunky to start with. Initially, not a great momentum, but I think probably as different things came from the government that kind of um, encouraged its use. I think now in our system we've got 90, all but four care homes are on that system now and are being encouraged um, and that's used on the technical call. And then um, one of our biggest achievements in the last month is kind of creating a digital platform for care homes where we've been rolling out WISM which is, if anyone doesn't know, I think of think of Harry Potter and Wizard, um, and it's got this blue box. Um, and um, any this is about as technical as I get, but it's um, got um, a blood pressure pulse um, oximeter um, and a portal and a thermometer, and the portal interprets the readings um, for the care home workers. And we've been training them virtually as well and on hands and developing all their competencies. So that was probably linked to. Um, the useful guidance that came out from the British Geriatric Society that looked at monitoring of deterioration. And of course, we're linking that with the work of Sin Significant Seven as well, looking at the softer signs of deterioration. And we had found those care homes that had been trained, some in London and um, some in Lewisham, that ironically, those care homes that were able to spot signs of deterioration um, sooner were more equipped and stood um, much better in their COVID journey than others that didn't. So we were kind of encouraged by that. Um, so, so much work, you know, when you look back and you just think, and my goodness, we've probably delivered uh, probably a couple of years work in seven months. And um, so, you know, it, it's been a very interesting journey. We've gained an awful lot from it, but I think probably more than anything is probably the sense of comrade comradeship between health and social care that has been amazing that has been amazing thank you Geraldine <clears throat> and so instead of looking back that seven months looking forward what I'm interested in is how much of what has been done and created do you think is best understood as crisis response and how much is really a model for um, support for care homes in the future. So you're describing multidisciplinary teams around care homes, um, a kind of qualitative shift in just the, the kind of pace and openness of communication, uh, remote monitoring of, of care home residents. Do you think, is, is this all going to stick or is it, is it going is it, is it to go back one, one day when, when we're, we're in a different position with COVID, do you think? 
I think probably has, has always been an advocate for older people and particularly an advocate for older people in care homes. I think there's been an underestimation always of the type of clients that are looked after in that format. And I think COVID has kind of, kind of, it's awoken people to that realization. And um, because once upon a time, those um, people that would be looked after in a care home might have been on a medical ward or in a community hospital somewhere. Um, and suddenly, um, and the accuracy and the frailty of those patients, because, you know, we haven't built an infrastructure for older people you know, in terms of skills um, and development of people. You know, I remember years ago, there was a the long term framework for older people. Oh, it was great in theory, but no money or structures or anything came with it. And then there was the one for long term conditions. And you're thinking, oh, will this happen now? And um, and it and it didn't. And you just thinking, actually, by this happening, actually, suddenly there's that dawning of the day, although as scary as it's been, that you just thinking actually we're going to have to do something this is our most vulnerable group with probably with staff that need the skills that definitely need support and that we can't just keep them on the sideline they're as much as part of our community as somebody else and they deserve the best um, and therefore it's important that we try and harness that as much as we possibly can so i am hoping it will keep and um, and, and certainly um, where I have a voice, um, I will make sure that I keep beating that drum to make that a reality because I've, I've been beating that drum for a couple of years, but suddenly to get traction of over that we've done over the last few months, it's been a very great thing, I think, for, for, those, for those vulnerable people. Mm, fan fantastic, thank you. Um, <clears throat> My brain is racing ahead in this conversation because I find it so <laughs> exciting. Um, I can see from the chat that <clears throat> this is practice that lots of other people are recognising from their own work and their, their own geography. So it's great to get that um, just exchange of, of advice and experience. Um, Alina, it'd be great to bring you in next. Um, um, just to say a bit about um, your experiences of Febris providing some of this remote monitoring. W what are you learning about um, the situation in care homes? and the role of remote monitoring um, in, in the context of care home support. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, I guess one thing to say up front, I'm by no means under the impression that I speak on behalf of care homes, uh, kind of echoing what uh, Claire was saying earlier. Um, I'm, if anything, I'm more of a servant. So I build technology that hopefully helps them do their job better um, and learn in the process and try and uh, kind of respond to the emerging needs. Uh, but the, by no means do I represent kind of the, the powerful and very diverse voice of all the care homes and the needs that are emerging at the moment there. Um, in terms of kind of the journey we've been on, so um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were very fortunate to uh, partner with Care City as well as received support from NHSX and set up a, um, a somewhat of a test bed in East London, um, looking at different care homes and how we can support the now many digital care pathways that are emerging uh, from the pandemic. We, as a company, were always very careful not to build technology, but to build solutions. I think I couldn't echo more what Geraldine is saying about the infrastructure building. Uh, I think for too long we've been under the impression that things like task shifting simply consist of giving someone else your job or a tool to do something that you used to do. Um, and that simply doesn't work if we're building really truly integrated care systems. Um, so from a technology perspective, what we, we aim to do is build a digital bridge that has decision support across the board. So yes, we have tools that enable carers to capture measurements and observations and integrate conventional uh, kind of evidence-based frameworks like Restore2. Uh, but more importantly, we focus on the decision support around this. So that, for example, if a carer needs to count respiratory rate, they have all the algorithmic support to capture errors and correct. And equally on the other end, if a GP is now um, having to review, let's say, longitudinal data and make decisions about deterioration, all of that captured by a carer, again, they have the support tools that highlight things like um, deterioration or where maybe some of the data is not as reliable because there was too much noise in the measurements. 
Um, I think that, that, that for me, that there's some of the kind of infrastructural decisions that we need to make today and couple that with really strong initiatives around capacity building and upskilling. Um, otherwise, a lot of this technology just sits there unused and doesn't actually solve problems. It just takes a few boxes here and there. Um, what we've, we have seen through the pandemic is kind of echoing what everyone else has said so far, um, a very kind of rapid mobilization and openness to adopting new practice. In a, lot of, in a lot of ways, digital health used to be a nice to have in these environments and through the pandemic, it became a must have, otherwise we couldn't deliver the care um, that a lot of people were used to. Um, but there were also emerging challenges, like we, we are doing things differently. Um, and there is a lot of learning across the board that needs to happen. There is a lot of multidisciplinary doing that didn't happen before that now needs to happen. Um, our, our kind of biggest role and lesson in that has been to be very responsive and not to assume that just because you have a technical function, that's the one that's gonna solve the problems moving forward. Um, so we have a very kind of proactive approach in that we work really closely with the care homes as well as the GP Federation as well as the CCD, CCG to really identify what are the care pathways that we're trying to support and how do we continue to evolve the technology so that it wraps around um, the workforce rather than the other way around uh, which has been the assumption for too long. Um, so I'll probably stop here and I'm sure there'll be many questions uh, moving forward. Great thank you. Um Claire, I wonder if you could help us sort of think critically about the potential of all of this, because I suppose many, many people on this call might have mixed, mixed feelings about this story. On the one hand, there's a kind of, um, there's the danger of the sort of transactional task shifting onto care that um, Alina flagged to us. There's, the, there's a risk of medicalization of patients, of NHS sort of doing too and all the rest of it. On the other hand, for me, there's an enormous opportunity here uh, for social care to, um, to me, um, care workers have rightly said, you know, in, in, the, in the discourse of 2020, the idea that we're unskilled is just a nonsense. Um, we're hugely skilled. I don't want that to obscure also the systematic way in which care staff have been cut off from many opportunities to learn and progress and to develop their, their knowledge and, and their careers. Um, do you think there's a way in which this kind of multidisciplinary work with and around care homes could be used to improve the lot, not just of residents, but of care homes and care staff too? Or do you think some of the, the sort of, some of the, the risks of sort of, of task shifting and the power imbalances involved make it just inherently difficult? Uh, thanks. I, I think it all goes back. You can do the same action, but for a different reason. So when you look at how we work together, there are some initiatives that are going into care homes to sort them out. And then the view is that once that's done, we can retreat and get on. And I think one of, I think Paula Evans has, you know, raised that question about, you know, once it, once everything goes back, will it go back to that? Um, and so it's almost like exploring how do these multidisciplinary teams understand their responsibilities towards each other. So because we have seen really good resident outcomes, you know, all the kind of things the NHS wants from care and what care homes want, you know, reduced unplanned admission, proactive care for people uh, with dementia and um, behaviours that staff find difficult where the understanding is, is that there is common ground. So you're not just going in to sort out an individual resident or an individual problem, but that actually this is an extension of um, the landscape of care that older people in this country needs. And this audience will know, but I'll say it again, that there are three times more care home beds than hospital beds. So this is where all our older people who need long-term care are. Um, and so what we found in studies, if you take example, incentivizing GPs, giving, putting in specialist care home teams, that of itself wasn't enough to change outcomes. It was when those GPs and therapists and nurses were validated as doing important work that the organizations all valued and where those teams saw that they were working up a relationship uh, with and partnering. I think Care City would 
be working absolutely to that model. So, but if you are going in to sort something out, I used, years ago, I used to have a slide of paratroopers, parachute, you know, like the SWAT team arriving. Um, the evidence shows that that doesn't work and everything does fall back very quickly once you remove that kind of initiative, which is very often tied to short-term funding. Great, thank you. Geraldine, you've no doubt been navigating a lot of this in practice in terms of how to build genuine partnerships across care homes um, and the health system more, more generally. What are you learning about what it looks like when it works best and which parts of, how do you want to embed that in what happens in the coming, coming months and years? Mm. It's a good question. Um, I think when we, we're three months into the work that we were doing, I was keen to, um, I interviewed 55 care homes. I rang them up um, at various points of the day because I was keen just to see how they were, where they're getting everything they wanted. And ironically, that was probably my most powerful piece of work and what we were doing because um, I think for some, I think what they were saying is what they'd, what they'd lost. Um, and um, and how we were coping with them. And I know Leslie Cookshank's on the call and and, and working with um, Leslie um, and the Prosper team. Um, they've been so amazing and that work they've done. And, and I know she'll say as well about some of the great work they've done with um, um, a lady whose name and, um, and eludes me now. Um, and, and Mandy Waring, that's it. Um, suddenly it'll come back to me. And um, um, of how, how how they are and how do we build that resilience so in terms of the positives i think it's i think the positives is everybody working together but also just making sure that when we've heard them they were kind of saying actually this is what we want now we don't want to feel like we were on our own we want to feel part of the team um and, I, and i'm a great believer in that we don't prescribe what needs to be changed because an awful lot of people we always kind of have that perception well this is what we need to do but ironically, what we need to do is listen to care homes to see what do you need, because sometimes we could be putting something on um, and creating something actually, and it's not needed at all. So in terms of that best thing, I think it's the, the importance of listening um, would be the best skill and also hearing so you can listen, but also to hear exactly what people need. And ironically, when you do that, you can then be able to develop a plan to be able to support those care homes. I think that's been our greatest thing. So it's, you know, it's quite a revelation when I rang them to kind of say, you know, what, what do you want? And, um, and what's it been feeling like? And the answers I've got were really empowered to make us to inform our next um, steps, especially in terms of the winter. Brilliant. Thank you. I mean, at, at Care City, we absolutely buy into the idea that partnerships between health and care need to be equal um, but I guess we want to find material ways to make that real to to translate enhancement in the roles of care home staff and actually at care city domiciliary carers too into improvements in their prospects their aspect their access to learning um, and to the, the London living wage um, because for me that's one way of pushing the question of are these partnerships really equal Sophie I just want to check in with you um, existential crisis about how, the, how the, this is all landing with people. I think I'm picking up from the chat actually quite a high level of literacy in sort of related kind of work. I see a Sarah Douglas in the chat talking about a new wound care service enabling care home staff to share photos of wounds for, for remote support that actually once you start to get to critical mass around these partnerships across a whole range of other um, issues and pathways um, new new opportunities for care staff um, start to start to open up that um, offer greater power and control to care homes themselves to 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 support the the the, the well being of their residents. Is there anything else you want to flag to us, Sophie? Um, just uh, Louise has um, has kind of raised a, a question about if whether there's anything being done to facilitate access to data that's been de-identified. Um, that as, as part of these technological solutions um, so that there can be some secondary data analysis done. Um, so it, does anyone have anything to, to kind of say? Yeah. Um, so Care City is part of some of that work in, in Barking and Dagenham, the Care City cohort, 
brings together data across all settings of care, in, including care homes, and now has a number of people, um, active PhDs working in the data set. But Claire, I'm sure you can give us a, a kind of more, more global picture around what's happening with care, with care home data. Okay, so, so that is exactly what we're trying to do with in this work package with the Health Foundation and which some ICSs um, have already started to do. Um, and I think, I think that the answer is that's the plan. But the challenge for care homes is that that's great if you're a commissioner and um, a policymaker, but in terms of how do you answer the so what question in terms of if you've required care home staff to log all this data and then they don't, then they're not enabled or supported to then act on it. And of course, I think this is maybe the challenge or question to put to Alina and, and the colleague, and I see all these narratives of different digital initiatives um, is how does one actually, because our research is showing that these things only kick off when staff can actually see the benefit uh, and, and, and actually can see and I think there was a question about NHS email and of course you have, if we're asking people to do more whereas the Datcha study is actually asking if we can use and aggregate as Louise is talking about about care home residents the routine data and pull them out of the system which previously has been very difficult then can we actually look very carefully at the genuinely minimum data and including maximizing the digital monitoring data, which care homes are, are collecting, the, the enabled ones are collecting a lot of digital, you know, vital signs and so on, but they need someone to work with them to interpret, to act, and to almost like, um, it's the noise of information, which is overwhelming. And we're also now, as we go into a second wave of COVID, that I see as a big red flag is that we started with no information and I've put up um, two links to two pieces of work of people responding to care home generated questions to now they've got more information than they know how to navigate and, and we have a responsibility to really take that forward and sort of almost in our organisation sort of say, okay, you know, this care home has been asked to complete a survey by four different organisations. You know, what is our responsibility here? Um, um, so, so yes, I think going forward, we will be able to look at de-identified data and begin to deliver what North America has been able to show about the population but the challenge is how do we make sure this isn't just another administrative layer of work that takes people away from actually providing care and then how can we help them use the data that they do get great Alina I don't know if you want to, to comment on that um, I think I think what's interested in what interesting in what Fibris is doing is partly you're using the AI to to get cleverer and cleverer at, at um, diagnosing and assessing the data you might see from someone's lung sounds or blood pressure but you're also using AI to be useful in real time to care homes themselves by providing real-time data checking to help to make the task of for example taking observations easier and easier how, but how could as as you work with more and more care homes as you get more and more data how can you continue to make that that partnership and that reciprocity between the work that you do and and the work of care homes themselves um, how can you keep that reciprocity right at the heart of your development work mm, yeah very good question i mean very much the underlining assumption or rather the underlining aspiration is to build smart architecture um, and smart infrastructure so if we are introducing innovation into care homes now how do we make sure that what we introduce today informs what we what we can do tomorrow and also how do we get to tomorrow with what we have today um, so which is why from our perspective it, it's never been sufficient to you know just capture data in one place and move it to another place there is a lot that need to be quantified in terms of do we even have the skill sets to capture that data in the right way um, so that's that's um, kind of what john is highlighting in terms of um, skill set evaluation and upskilling that's happening in real time. So for example, when a carer takes a measurement with, let's say, a digital stethoscope, straight away we have algorithms that would identify, did they forget the radio in the background, um, which, which is why um, the measurement won't be useful to a doctor when they re-listen to it. Um, so a lot of this is basically embedding 
the multidimensional kind of complexity that the care home environment presents into what we captured today so that we can gradually measure the change that's happening. Um, and we have seen this in East London. So in the beginning, um, if I have to be completely honest, the GPs were petrified <laughs> that the carers are suddenly doing auscultation, which is traditionally a process only a GP owns or a, a clinician owns in a, in a very kind of centralized setting. Um, and yes, originally they did forget to turn off the telly and there were all sorts of songs and uh, programs playing in the background. But gradually, that, that's, for me, that's the kind of the real experience of task shifting. Gradually, you can see the technology supporting that decision making and then the clinician gaining confidence in what the carer is now responsible for doing on their behalf or in a team together. Um, so and that, that's for me point one. The other point is around the level of personalization that needs to happen both on the care home level as well as on a patient level. Um, but our biggest, biggest learning in this environment has been that there isn't a one size fits all. Us assuming that every care home will be able to do virtual ward rounds every week and they'll be of an equivalent quality. Um, but honestly, it's just quite naive and underestimating the challenges that they have on an ongoing basis. Um, so how, how do we build technology that really understands the fundamentals of each care environment? And often that's an ecosystem of a care home and a GP. And then takes a practical view. For this care home, the most appropriate thing would be to, let's say, do a routine checkup for each um, resident once a month and, also, and reactive um, on top of that if anyone's feeling unwell. For a different care home that's differently staffed and differently skilled, it is more appropriate to do, let's say, regular mon monitoring every week. Um, so for us, it's building up both the kind of sensitivities in the care home and the GP, as well as the digital infrastructure for us to quantify and stratify these environments to that level. Otherwise, someone is always going to be disappointed because we're trying to apply work processes that are simply not designed and fitted for their purpose. Thank you. And <clears throat> also in the chat, I think a really important comment from Carol Gillespie saying we need to remember these are people's homes and not to over medicalize the environment and I'm sure I'm sure we all agree with that and that, that we feel we need to become more and more sophisticated about understanding what it is in everybody's interests to, to measure and also what it, it isn't in everybody's interest to measure and what we're not going to going to monitor. Geraldine I don't know if, if you have any thoughts about that anxiety that we, we could forget that the, these are people's own homes and that um, for the very best of intentions in trying to um, draw people into, um, to improve people's access to primary care and to do more su to support their health, um, initially, of course, in, in response to this awful pandemic, that there is that risk around over medicalization and around redu re reducing choice and control of, of residents themselves. I think we are, um, as, as a family, we have a relative, a close relative in a care home um, during COVID. And it's been a, a very interesting time. And, and for him as well, um, just been in a care home full stop. So he, he recognised, um, obviously, his health had changed greatly and he went into the care home. But he went into the care home to feel safe. So in terms of that's what he, he wanted and, and felt that needed to do for him at that time. Um, and ironically, sometimes um, what we find is as a, as a family, he gets, if he hasn't got seen the right people or get, you know, somebody, a district nurse isn't going in, he's in, in a totally different part of the county. Um, obviously that worries him a lot. So he gets a lot of assurance by people going in to see him and the equipment is used and he doesn't want to feel like he's been forgotten just because he doesn't live on his own any home anymore. So I think for, for that, I find that has been very helpful in terms of what we've had to do with Dick Care Homes as well, because we've been able to kind of use his voice as well in terms of, and because um, I'll always say, you know, what would work for you? What, what do you think is making a difference? So, and, and use that for the greater good, because then we can mould what, what's needed as well, because they do, residents want to feel safe. You know, um, and, and when we've been educating carers um, and, and staff, we all say by the time people have come to your care home, they've lost so much. They've lost 
function, independence, um, and, and their voice. So it's important that we kind of recognize that and we support the workers to kind of be able to make that a reality. Um, and so um, I think so by using their voice to kind of say, well, what do you need as well? But so they, so I think based on the work we've done, um, we're work, going to be working as well in the spring. We're going to be working with Health Watch because I'm keen to kind of know what's it, what's it's it like for the patient's voice and and so that we get that involved in the next stage of our projects as well because i think by doing that we will kind of get a clearer um indication of wonder what worked during this journey as well um, um whether that's you know what we did did they feel forgotten or did they feel secure and it's interesting for John, who's he's in that care home. You know, he mightn't have seen us, but we all will do intro, um, do our visual, virtual setups, etc. It's fifteen minutes visits. It's not. It's very long way. Um, with five hours away in a car for a fifteen minute visit, but you're thinking, well, how do you utilise that? So you're just thinking, and it's terrible that for care homes they've had to kind of exploit to that. Um, um conditions that they have to do those things as well to make a reality and of course that will bring loads of things in terms of isolation etc so i think in terms of we're going to be um safeguarding and and looking after residents it's important that we make sure that they don't feel that they're forgotten and that in terms of that we're perfect um protected them for all sorts not just COVID. that we need to be looking at them as a human being and and what they would need as part of this journey as well so that yeah we're not shutting up the doors and forgetting about them as kind of just making sure that what they need and that their voice is heard in what we're doing so i think it's, we can't utilize that it's back as, as carol just says there is about finding that balance and that kind of um kind of sums it up exactly yeah i guess my reflection is that for a long time we've had a health system oriented about around hospitals and going to hospital <clears throat> and that to an extent now we're having to build a health system oriented around um, remote access and um, avoiding preventable conveyances to hospital and admissions to hospital um, <clears throat> and for me that gives an opportunity to put care homes centre stage um, <clears throat> not just in sticking up for their residents but in changing medicine to be more personalised and more respectful of the range of choices people make um, based on not just their health but their, their well-being and their, their, um, their own independence too. Um, I get, and I guess I'm sort of excited about that reorientation. Claire, I don't know if you want to add anything to this discussion. I'm just looking at the time. Um, I, I just what I want to add is that there is all this pooled learning and what I think troubles me a bit is how do we bring this into fora where actually those who are not this involved in these kind of digital innovation and these virtual initiatives that in the same way that you would have nice guidance and so on that there would be a common a commonality so that Geraldine's work you know would it would just be a given that people would have heard of it and know about it rather than through all the different channels we have. And Datcha is the study I'm talking about, um, is, is keen to pull all that together. So it's just a, a reflection on that. And as I say, we are trying to catch a, a runaway train in some ways, because obviously, um, oh, I have a daughter who works in digital innovation. She talks about dis social disruptors. You know, they just go off and do, and, 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 and the organizations who they're working with Get very twitched about the governance and the and the checking and the standardization and that's going to be the issues that we're dealing here particularly as obviously there isn't one provider who is a care home it's just you know from five bedded care homes to ones that go into the hundreds um, so I think it's more a reflection of how can we, and it comes all the way back to the beginning that Geraldine was making about the absence of infrastructure. We have all the great ideas, but we need to actually build in the expectation that you wouldn't ever think about this population without really engaging with what do we know about our care homes? What do we know about our staff and our residents? And I think COVID has pushed that 
further down, you know, has brought it into plain sight um, um, where, where they were always there, but they were hidden. Um, so I suppose that's just the reflection of what next as we've only got six minutes, I think. So we should shut up. Um, oh, blimey, don't do that. Um, I mean, I think that's why it's lovely that UCL partners are hosting this discussion. And um, because I think um, significant providers across UCL partners geography are thinking about these questions. Um, they want part of the legacy of 2020 to be more than we become excellent at some point at providing PPE testing, MDT support, um, and isolation advice to care homes, but that we make lasting changes for the better in our relationships with care homes. So I think, I think there's a willingness across the health system um, but what does that mean and what should we do about it? And I think it's in part of the conversation that, that, that we're having um, about remote monitoring, not just as a way to improve access to primary care, but to start to reorient the role that acute providers play in reaching out and ensuring care home residents have access to best care rather than being simply being conveyed when they're very sick. Um, is it can be the basis of a different sort of conversations between health systems and, and care homes collectively um, a, a, to unlock new opportunities for residents and, uh, and, and for me, new opportunities for, for care staff to, to progress in their, their lives and, and their careers. So, uh, I mean, um, we are re recording this session both literally, literally in, our, in our notes and it, it will be really helpful to, to draw on the insights in the conversation in, and in the chat in trying to ask, answer that question um, of health and care system leaders about what can be, we be, do in our partnership with care home beyond crisis response. Um, there's a specific question um, from Daniel Casson in, in the chat which I think is yeah, great. There's lots of fantastic tech that we could get into care homes, but it all costs money. And the one thing we know about the care home sector is that it's, um, it doesn't have huge margins to pay for all this. I mean, um, my, I, I, I think part of the answer to that is um, that's, that's precisely the point, that part of reorienting the health and care system means that um, it needs to become the norm rather than the exception for for the health system in one form of or another to be investing in health in infrastructure not just around care homes but in care homes and we need to get really good at building the evidential case and the business case to help to help them to do that but Geraldine I don't know how how you think issues around resourcing um, either are being dealt with now or may need to be dealt with in the future because um, asking asking care providers to invest you know, now more than ever, um, is, is not an easy, it's not an easy ask to make, is it? No, it isn't. But there's also some also opportunities as well in terms of putting bids in, etc. So we had created this digital platform and, and then we thought actually what we're going to need now is change agents to make this a reality, working with care homes um, helping them with the equipment, making NHS mail a reality. So we've recently put in a bid um, and we've been able to secure some funds so that we can make that a reality. So it's kind of, we're going to have to be the eyes and the ears for care homes to kind of look at those opportunities. And in one way, I think UCLP do such a great job in doing that and, and Care City and yourselves to be able to help navigate that world so that suddenly we have nearly a community of practice for care homes and the work that we're doing to give that structure. I think that would be a really powerful thing. And, and I'm, I'm very encouraged because you see today that there's going to be a chief nurse for social care being advertised. And I think that's going to be such a, an exciting thing for social care, I think. Um, and in terms of how we can uh, uh, kind of align health and social care together more and influence that agenda. So I think that's really, um, I think, good direction going forward. But I think we're only at the beginning, John. This is this is so exciting, Geraldine. There's 87 people on this call, and we all vote for you for that job. So <laughs> it's going to be a letter writing campaign. I'll send out the template um, after this call. Um, we are running short of time. People need to go back to their to their work in a moment. Um, Alina, is there any 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 final comment or reflection you want to share? 
Um, I guess maybe just a final thought on the on, on this question of kind of resources and resource sharing. Um, two things on that front. One is we, as difficult as it is and bureaucratically impossible, still we really need to move away from thinking about healthcare and social care as two different systems because integrated care would never realize benefits until we, we kind of just achieve that mind shift. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say is that social care is already investing in, in these innovations by virtue of the carers absorbing all this work that used to happen in GP practices and hospitals. The time investment has already been made. Um, so I think it's, it's only fair uh, that we find kind of blended models that would support them in just scaling this and really facilitating the, the, the more integrated approach across multidisciplinary teams. Claire, what last word of wisdom do you have for us? Oh, I think just to reiterate my plea, please could people email me and tell me what they're doing. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you for uh, actually just, I think I've learned more than I've shared really. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Claire. And yeah, yeah, I think your contacts are in the chat for that. Is that correct, Claire? Great. Thank, thank you to all my panellists, Claire, Alina and Geraldine. Thanks to Sophie for organizing all of this. Thank you um, to all of you for um, listening, engaging and, and participating. Um, I hugely appreciate it. Um, I've, I've hugely enjoyed the conversation too. And I think the point for all of us is to, to take conversations like this and, and to make sure that out of 2020 we get a lasting difference and a lasting benefit for, for care home residents and, and, that, and their staff. And I look, look forward to collaborating with many of you on, on that front. M many thanks to you all for your time.